If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to 1 John. We're going to read um, verses 1 through 4. The incarnation of the word of life. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. The last words that Tiffany read were this. We write this to you to make our joy complete. We write this to you to make our joy complete. What is John talking about? He's, he's saying that in the church, I want to see complete joy. I want to see the church full of joy, of people that are, that are understanding what joy is and they're expressing it. What is joy? It's, it's the complete fulfillment, all right? It's, it's having all of your desires, all your needs fulfilled and satisfied, not looking to anything else, but knowing that what you have in your life is enough. And he, so he says this, when I, and I'm writing this letter to you, I want the response to bring joy, complete joy into your life. Does this define your life? Does this define the church, the church in general? When people look outside and they look into the church, do they see a place and people that are full, overflowing with joy? Or do they see something different? Today we are beginning a, a series in the book of First John. It's, it's called Remain. We're actually going to look at First John, Second John, Third John over the probably next two and a half months. So we're going to take a little time and to sit in this book. And we call it Remain because of that word being in here so many times. Depending on your, your translation, you're going to see Remain or Abide or Live. Over and over again, John's going to continue to say, remain in Jesus, abide in Jesus, live in Jesus, let this just overflow into your life. Don't abandon, don't leave, but stay and remain in him. What's the reason for that? See, when, when John looks at the church that he pastored, the church that he was a part of, he had such a pastoral heart. He writes, and you'll see it as we get through this book, so many times. He says, my children, my little children, love one another. That's from what we hear in, in other literature. That was his phrase. That's what he said time and time again. My children, love one another. Here he's writing, my children, I want to say joy in your life. And sometimes when we look at the church, we don't see it. We see people fighting. We see people disgruntled. We see people about ready to give up. That's what John saw in his church, and it's not that different than the church today. So even 2,000 years plus since John wrote this, we can look at our church, our community, and, and see these same things, see that we need joy in our church. We need joy in our life, that people are ready to abandon. They're ready to leave they're ready to follow other ideas and thoughts, but not remain in Christ. What was happening in that day? When John was writing, there was a, 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 a philosophy growing uh, called Gnosticism. Okay, some of you may not use that word normally, but you've heard it, right, when we talk about atheists and agnostics, right? Atheist, someone who does not believe in a God, or, or ag agnostic, someone who doesn't believe in that knowledge, right, that there's a, a way for salvation, Okay? They're not maybe arguing about God, but just, we just don't believe that God can be known. There's salvation in that. This is that, kind of the other side of that, the, the, the knowledge. There were people in the church that were uh, 
that were coming into the church, they were teaching and they were saying, uh, see, if you really want to know God and you want to have that salvation, you have to have a special knowledge, right? This here, what you have is not enough. You need something special. They also talked a little bit about um, how we were made, right? Saying, looking at the world, just saying the world, it's physical. Your bodies are physical. There's, it's material. All this material is flawed. It's evil. It's wicked. It, it's no good. So if you want to have salvation, you need to flee from this, the material, the world around us, and have that special knowledge to find something spiritual, Okay? It was a, a philosophy that was coming into the church, and it was dividing the church. The church was, was kind of arguing on this. Do we need it? Do we not? Right? Do we have the knowledge? Is, God, is Jesus' word enough? Do we need something special? And there was these the arguments that were brewing, and they would continue to brew for quite some time. In fact, many people would say that we even have it today. It has, it has made its roots into the church. And you may uh, have followed this, you just don't even know it. But we talked about it a few times this summer when we were talking about our Kingdom Come series. And it goes like this. This is how it, it really finds its way in the church. That we say these same things. This world is evil. All right? This world is wicked. All right? This world is going to hell in a handbasket. Like those kinds of words. Right? And so we need to, to escape the world and find something that's spiritual. And so when we talk about heaven, we think about heaven as a spiritual place where our, our spirits, our disembodied spirits, float in this kind of undefined place for eternity. And that's what we have for heaven, that heaven is where our spirits go, and they're with other spirits, and we just spend eternity worshiping and singing and angels and, and all of that. But we've said over the course of the summer, and we continue to say, that is not the truth that we find in the scriptures. That's Gnosticism that has come into the world, come into the church. So what is the truth? That's what he is writing about. That's because he's writing his church to say that you guys, that uh, yes, there, there is a spiritual world, but we, God has given us a physical world. He's created this world. He's created our bodies. Our bodies are good. And when we look at eter eternity, when we look at that eternity, it's the kingdom of heaven coming in its realness. Real heaven and earth, re, uh, purified and remade. But the real heaven, real earth, where our real bodies will spend eternity in heaven. So he's, this is his issue. And this is the issue that is dividing the church. And he's saying, it is stealing your joy. It's robbing your joy. I'm writing for you, writing to you to correct these things, to get your alignment back off of the false things but in the heresies, but get your alignment back to the truth where you will find joy. This is important because we, as followers of Christ, we are called into this body, this fellowship, what we call a church community, a Christian community. It is important because the world looks. The world looks. The world looks in these churches. And what do they see? Do they see the arguing and the bickering and the dividing and the splitting? Or do they see people that are from different backgrounds, with different perspectives and different beliefs that come to love one another and to partner together and to see God's kingdom come. What do they see? It's important for us to continue to seek the truth, to keep our eyes on Christ and to see where he's leading. But God has always given us joy. Joy, it's an eternal uh, 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 kind of motion for us. It's an eternal fact that God has given it to us from long ago, that it's found not in the world but in Christ. John wrote uh, in his gospel the words of Jesus. When Jesus said this, he says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. And hear this, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. And Jesus has already said this. And years later, John has been meditating on this, on these words. If you remain in my love and my love remains in you, your joy will be complete. 
So where do we find joy? We don't find it in the world. There's elements in the world where we can certainly find joy. But it comes through Jesus Christ. So joy is what, Paul, what John is after. He wants it to be complete in our lives, and he brings this truth to life. I write this to you that your joy may be complete. So as we start this letter, that's what he's after. That's what he wants to be embodied here in this community, to joy, to be filled through our lives, that it bubbles up and, 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 and goes out into this world, the joy of Jesus Christ. So we'll look at that today and see that as we find joy, we have to find it only in Jesus Christ. We find it in him. We find joy in proclaiming the, the name of Jesus Christ, and we find it in being together as, as, as children of God, as followers of Christ, that there's joy here together. So those are the three things that as he starts this letter, he says, I want you to find joy. You're going to find it in Jesus, you know, in proclaiming his name, and as you are together in relationship there is joy. So let's look at these three things. First, we see joy comes because God has come near. Right? We have joy because God has come near. Look at verse 1. It says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked at, with the, looked at and our hands have touched, we proclaim concerning the word of life. It's a funny introduction if you've read other books, other letters in the New Testament. They usually start with, hey, this is John, I'm writing to so-and-so, and and here's my uh, my greeting, I greet you in the name of Christ. But John doesn't do this. He jumps right into it in, in a way very similar if you remember the gospel of John, his other letter, right? The gospel that was right in to say, here's how you can find salvation. Now in this letter, he's saying, here's how you remain in Christ, but in, in his first gospel, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. He was with God. He was in the beginning, right? And here he says, in now, that which was from the beginning, we proclaim to you. John's going to establish a theology before anything else that it's going to be all about Jesus, right? This is all about Jesus. He was the one from the beginning, okay? Jesus is the one who is from the beginning. He as outside of time. He's eternal, right? Jesus, 100% divine. Some people, we look at that like, how can God not have a beginning, right? How can he be eternal? Everything we know has a beginning, right? And so I, maybe you've struggled with this. You've thought about I've thought about it too. So how can he just always be? But we have to remember this. That God created this world. He created it with time. Right? He created you and I with time, created everything with time, that everything has a, in this world, it has a beginning, it has an end, but he is outside of time. But everything in this world, it has a beginning, it has an end. If you don't believe that, just let your milk sit in your refrigerator for another month or so, and you'll see that it has an ending. Right? This last week, we, I bought some milk, and I opened it up. It had several days left on you know, that little date, several days I poured it into my cereal, took a bite, and it, it, was, it was long gone. It was terrible throughout the cereal. Um, the, the regretful part that I regret, I don't know why I did, I put it back in the refrigerator. <laughs> so an hour later, my wife pours that milk into her coffee and immediately throws it out. She's like, why did you put it back in the refrigerator? The funny thing is she put it back in the refrigerator too afterwards. But um, I finally took that milk carton down to the grocery store and said, you need to give me a new one. Um, but... Uh, that has an end, right? If you saw the, the news, if you're uh, kind of catching up with like, uh, over at West Point, do you hear kind of what happened this last month? They found a time capsule, a time capsule that was 200 years old, right? And uh, they pulled it out, and they were like, what is in this? You know, they x-rayed it. They couldn't find anything. And so they had a ceremony this last month where they opened it up, and they had, you know, people gathered and all that. They, they op- cracked it open. They put their hand in there, and they found just silt. It was just dust, in dirt, right? And they're like, what kind of a joke is this, you know? But they, they said, they said, we doubt that they put uh, nothing in the time capsule. Whatever it was had dissolved with the weather, right? The point is everything dissolves. Everything ends, but not God because he's outside time. He, he's the one that created it. He does not have a beginning or an end. He's always existed. He always will. He was from the beginning, that he's 
the God who has always been. He's the one that created. Even John says that in his gospel. Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. He's the one that created the world. But he's also the one that has come into our lives. He's the one that came into this world. Jesus, fully God, fully divine. That he came and said, I hear my voice, see me, touch me. And he's the same one that enters in close to you and says, I hear your voice. I see you. All right? I'm touching you. I'm showing you that love. That God, the one who created everything, was the one who's come into our lives to hear us, to see us, to love us, to be known so that we can hear, see, and love him. See, I mean, you guys know about like how famous people treat the general public, right? Famous people, they, they stay away, right? They, they stay away. They have their bodyguards and they have their big gates and their houses and all that. They want to stay away from people like you and I. But God doesn't do that. He didn't put up these barriers and, you know, have all these cones out around him. No, he comes into our life. So right from the beginning, he's like, I'm writing to you to fulfill your joy. And the reason why you can have joy is because, because the God who created us, who's outside of time, came into our lives to love you, to know you. It starts right there. What does it mean that he came near? I mean, that he was born into this world as a fully human boy, right? He didn't come on a spaceship, right? He didn't come from outer space on some spaceship that the U.S. Air Force has and is examining right now. He didn't do that. He wasn't beamed down by Captain Kirk. Wasn't anything like that. Didn't go to another galaxy far, far away. He came here, born as a boy. Right? It means that, yes, he's 100% God, he's divine, but he's fully human. 100% God, 100% human. Uh, that's, again, another thing people have a hard time. How does 100% 100% make a fool? That, shouldn't that be like you know, 50% and 50%? And so many people have been troubled over this, and they struggle with this. Some people have said, well, God, is just, his, his, his body was human, but his mind was, was divine, Right? Uh, that's one of the things. There's other things that say that, no, he wasn't, he wasn't really a human being at all, right? That this is kind of some of the Gnostic beliefs. But he was more like a ghost, right? He didn't eat. He didn't sleep, right? When he walked on the beach, he didn't leave footprints, you know, that, that we, we saw him and heard him, but he was, he was not human. Or others would say, yeah, he was, he was human, right? But at his baptism, that's when God came on him. That's when he became divine. He lived that way for about three years. But just before his crucifixion, then God left. And then now he's just a human again because God can't be crucified. There's all these ways that people have tried to answer this. How can he be fully God and fully man? But John is writing this. He, he says this so in, intentionally, right? That was which from the beginning, right? What did he say? That we have heard, that we have seen, that we have observed, that we have touched with our hands. This isn't a ghost. He's telling them, saying, you guys believe that Jesus is just this weird spiritual thing, right? That he's not human, but we have heard him. We've heard him. We've seen him. We've looked at him. We've touched him. Do you see the progression too? It's like we've heard him. Like, you can hear anybody. They can be outside these walls and we can hear them. We don't know who they are, but we hear their voice. But then he says, now we've seen him. And we can see somebody from a, a great distance, depending on how your eyes are, you know. <laughs> you can see clearly or just a, a, a blob, right? But we can see people from a long way. But he says, too, like we've observed. We've gazed into your eyes. We've held the stare. We've looked at you. Right? You know when you see somebody that's just catching your interest at you know, your restaurant or something, and they look at you, and you know that you should turn away and look away, but you don't? <laughs> like, it's that. It's the, the staring in their eyes and looking at them. And it's the touch, the, the most intimate, the most physical. Not just a brush, not just a handshake, but we have held on to him. Coming from John, who, 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 who leaned against Jesus at the Last Supper. This is our God, right? He's not a ghost. 
He's not just a, a spirit, but he truly came here as, as fully God and as fully man so that he could represent us on the cross, but do what we could not do. I have a sinless sacrifice. So as he looks at this, it's like, how do we find joy? He says, it's in Christ. It's in Christ alone. That, that it's, it's enough to have someone just know you and love you for who you are. But it's the God of the universe, the one who created, the one outside of time, who knows your name, who's called you, seen you, and loved you. He says, he's the one that knows us and that we're, we're gathered around. It's Christ. That there is the basis for our joy. So Jesus, God, has come near us. The second part of that joy is that we get to testify about him, that we get to share this joy with him. Now, how many of you, if I say evangelism, that puts joy in your heart? <laughs> Most people don't, right? There's, there's probably a few people that are like, I love it. I, that does fill me with joy. Most of us don't, for whatever reason. It's not, I don't know, maybe it's when we don't know what to say. Maybe it's because it's just really personal and we're introverts and, like, it's hard for us to share personal things, you know, whatever it is, with people. I, I, there's probably lots of reasons. But John's continuing to say, like, you want to find joy. You want to be complete joy. It's found in Jesus Christ, and it's found as we proclaim him, as we declare his name. Look at verse 2. The life appeared, be Christ, and we have seen it, we testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was the Father, which was what the Father has appeared to us. That what we get to we find joy, we proclaim this, we declare this. We have to talk about the person we love, right? We testify about many things, don't we? No, we, you do. You testify about lots of things, um, athletics and, and sports and teams. Uh, yesterday kicked, or this weekend kicked off uh, college football, right? Uh, some of you were proclaiming that. You wore your, your jerseys or your shirts, right? And uh, given the first weekend of, of, uh, of college sports, it's probably good. USC, UCLA, you both have wins. Good job. Um, it, it, it may not continue that way. But, uh, but right now you proclaim, you testify, you declare it, you're excited, Right, you testify about many other things, right? Your, your weight loss program, you know, that you're excited about. Or your ethnicity or your background, you testify about that. You testify uh, about, um, you know, what your kids are doing, right? Their, their amazing accomplishments in their sports. You, you, uh, you can even brag about what your dog or cat does, you know? You post these little videos on Instagram or whatever, and it's, it's like that's your testifying. You are testifying about these things. We know how to testify about things that we like, things that grab our interest. But, but what John is saying is, I, I need you to testify about the one who's more important than all of those things, the ultimate one who brings love and joy, and that obviously being Jesus Christ, to testify about him. And, and we, you can testify so many ways, all right? It's not just knocking on the, somebody's door and just like, do you know Jesus? Can I share with you? That, there, there is, that's great. There's a point to that. And we, that it is important that we know how to share our faith. But we testify so many different ways, right? Um, some of you are going to testify on social media, right? You post up verses or, or, or you're sharing your thoughts, you know, you're, you're sharing values that you have received um, through God's word and things like that. So there's testifying there. There's testifying as you, you sh share with your friends. You have friends that are going through hard things, going through hard times, right? And you, you enter into that relationship with them like, how do you get yourself through these things? How do, how do you find help or hope? And then you share what you have, right? The, the hope that you have, that, that maybe how you've gotten through hard times with, with, the, with your, your small group or people from church and your, your foundation on Christ, Right, being able to share those things. You, you do that through entering um, relationships, asking people questions, but also just in proclaiming the gospel in sharing the hope that you have, right? And I hope, I hope all of you know that. I hope all of you know the gospel and that you're excited to share it because it, it's that truth. We talk about the people we love, right? We, we talk about the things we love, 
right? We talk about the things and the people we love. And so if you are loving Christ, it's, it's more natural to share your hope in him. Some of you parents, I know, you, you, you love your kids and you, you love their accomplishments. I see your volleyball videos or your, your wrestling videos, your baseball videos, like, and I'm too, I do that, right? Um, we, we're excited. We love our kids and we love their accomplishments and we talk about that to our friends. We talk about that at parties. I'm like, oh, let me tell you what my kids are doing and all that. But if we truly love our Lord Jesus, if we understand how much he has loved us, and if we have spent time developing that relationship, it should just come out in these relationships. It should come out in these conversations. We should be able to say the, the, the power of the, of the gospel. And if you don't know kind of the whole, like all the, the verses and the parts of the gospel, just think of the Bible. Like, where does it start? It starts with creation. God created this world. He created a world that he was king, right? But that we rebelled against him we walked away and we tried to build our own lives away from him right we, we rebelled against him but in that perfect moment god sent his savior all god all man who could be the sinless sacrifice and represent us and die on the cross to forgive us from those sins so that through faith we can put our faith in jesus christ and be forgiven be completely forgiven and have complete new relationship with the God of eternity and that we go now and we represent him. We share his love with others. We go to bring joy to this community, to see it flourish. We want to see lives uh, grow and in, be engaged. We want to do whatever we can to love other people. We do that because his kingdom is real and his kingdom will come. We don't know when that day is, but someday he will return. That kingdom of God will be here on earth. You can say it lots of different ways, but do you know the gospel and can you share it? Do you love Jesus? Or don't force yourself. If you don't love him, if you don't know it, then, then take your time and just abide with Jesus and love him and learn from him. And as you grow in your love, you will share that, that relationship just naturally. We do it through our words, but we do it through our actions too. And this is really important. And as the church, we are to be that hands and feet, to bring, bring, be the tangible kingdom of God to this world. And how do we do that? How do we really show God's love to this world? All right, um, we, we do it through caring for the, the least of these. That's what Jesus says, right, in, in Matthew 5, or 25. He says, you, you show your love when you care for the least of these. The people that have been uh, looked over by society. The people that society does not value. When you love them, you love me. I had a, a conversation with um, somebody I know. He's probably half my age. Um, love him but we were talking about the church and he said this about the church he's like i'm kind of done with it like i mean i grew up in it but i'm done with it because all i see is the like the oppression you know of the man oppressing other people you know and i don't it doesn't i don't like that and it, like i want to argue that but like well haven't you looked and seen you know all the good that's happening but but from his perspective and, and probably rightly so, he's seen a lot of abuse happen in church, right? A lot of, a lot of power struggle, uh, unfortunate, of, of leaders pushing people down. And, and unfortunately, that is a, a, a part of the church history, right? But what I wanted to say, and what we did talk about, is that that breaks God's heart too, like, it doesn't just break your heart, it, it breaks God's heart. You look through the, through the scriptures, you don't see anywhere where God says, oh, I love the oppressor. In fact, our Bible reading for a church, uh, where we've been reading for the last year and a half, called The Road to Emmaus, um, kind of taken three years to write, read through the Bible, and this week we're in Psalms. And I was just looking at this and just seeing, like, through, like, all these different psalms that we were reading this week. It says, God laughs at the proud. He hates the wicked and the boastful evildoers. He's against the greedy, boastful, arrogant schemer. Uh, psalm 11, he hates the violent people, right? He hates those who are lovers of violence. In 12, he cuts off the boastful and flattering and deceptive people. You can keep going on, but you see what I'm saying? Like, that has never been God's heart. 
But when Jesus came, what did he do? He got down and he, he lifted up those who were, who were knocked down, those who were vulnerable, those who were broken, those who were on the outskirts. He showed that love. So where, why has the church gone so wrong with this? How have we become the oppressor when Jesus is saying, that's the things I hate? Listen, if we are going to be the hands and feet of Jesus, we've got to stop just looking out after ourselves and caring for ourselves. And we've got to look out for those who are vulnerable, those who are on the outside, those who have been knocked down. So whether they're incoming immigrants or refugees, I don't know, those with special needs, poor, needy, whatever it is, like there's so many examples. We as a church, we have to reach out to them. We've got to love those people. Like we do a good job taking care of ourselves, and that's great. Like there's a great amount of love and care. For our church, where we're going next is we have to go out into that world to be the hands and feet, and, and to do it not because we have to, but because it brings joy to our lives. When we proclaim Jesus and his love, it brings joy to us. I don't see it as optional, but it's who we are where we need to go. Because Paul or John is saying, I'm writing to you to make your joy complete. It starts with Jesus, but it's found in proclaiming him. Our proclamation of God should bring joy. And I, I, I think the world is looking for a church. They're just looking for anyone who can bring justice, love, respect, kindness. And these are all values in the church, so we should be doing this. The world may, may not, I don't know. But we as a church, we've got to live these values out and proclaim it and do it because it brings joy. All right, much more to be said on that, but let me wrap this up. And we see that joy is complete through Jesus Christ, that knowing who he is and loving him through the proclaiming the person we love. But it also, it comes through the fellowship of the saints. Right? It comes through this community. Look at verses three and four. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. As Christians, we are not these little isolated people kind of out here just doing our own thing, just in our own homes, um, kind of writing our own blogs and all that. We are a community that has fellowship with one another. And this is important because remember, in this church, this church is being kind of divided. They're fighting. They're ready to split. He says, but, but we proclaim these things so that we can have fellowship together. This is, we're not just a social club, right? We're not just this, um, you know, an academy to grow our knowledge. We're not just a place for good entertainment or good food or anything like that. We are in this partnership of this shared experience of Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ has changed my life. He's changed your life. We're coming together to experience that, to, to celebrate what God has done and what he's doing. We're talking with others about our experience. We're helping those who are hurt, those who are struggling to continue on, to, to, to keep their eyes on Christ, to grow through that pain. We're, we're doing those things together. We're discovering our gifts, how to use them, how to how to support one another. That's our Christian community. Yeah, we all have our personalities. We all have our differences. We all, we all have our uniqueness. And sometimes we're going to rub each other the wrong way. Sometimes we're going to frustrate each other. But too often, the easy answer is like, I'll just go to another church. I'll just leave. That cannot be. You guys, that, when I look at my, like, back at my ministry, I've been in ministry, oh, I don't know, oh, 29 years. The thing that hurts the most is seeing that, seeing people just kind of, they, they loved each other, they had a small issue, and then they divide. Because it's so easy just to go to the church over there or over there. But I have seen it, not many times, but a few times. People saying, we loved each other, we hurt each other, but we're going to come and love each other again. We're going to fight for that relationship. We're not going to take the easy route out and just go somewhere else. We're going to stay here. I believe that's the power. That's where the power is. 
Guys, we are going to hurt each other. We're not perfect. Right? We're not. We're going to frustrate each other. We're going to offend each other. We're not going to do it intentionally. No, please, no. But these will happen. But when that happens, it's, is, is, it, is it worth holding on to you to remain, to remain in Christ? To say, I'm not going to let that steal my joy. Because God has given me this joy. He's died for this. He's died for me. He's given us this church to be a part of and to love. I'm going to hold on to that. We're going to love deeper. We're going to love better. We're going to be stronger in that. And write this to make your joy complete. Our joy comes in the real physical, spiritual relationship that we have with Jesus. It comes when we, when we delve deep into how much he's loved us and we, we, we soak that in. When we abide with Christ and love him and then when we share that and we do it together as a church family, that's where joy is. And so many of us, we settle for so far less. We don't find joy in what Christ has done. We don't find joy in sharing about him and proclaiming. And we don't find joy together. But guys, that, that is not a church. That is not a Christian experience. That's not what, what John was writing about. He's saying, I want so much more. Do you want more? Do you want this? Do you want complete joy? I do. And so how we do it, a few things. I mean, we're going to abide in his love. Right, just abide with him. Just spend time with him. Try to have a close relationship with him. Talk with him. Read. Think. You know, when you go for a walk, then put your earphones on and listen to your 90s music. Like, just spend time talking with him. And talking with him. And just enjoying him. And see where the conversation goes. We abide with him. We draw near to him. We strive to, 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 to live a righteous life, not to make God love us more, but because God loves us completely. And I just want to live my life right before him and with others. And I want to have fellowship with each other. I want to find fellowship in this body of Christ that God has died for, that Jesus died for, that he redeemed. I want to find joy here. So may we go out in this world. May we go out as joyful people who have been loved, who have been called into something great. May we go out and show the tangible love of Jesus to this world. They need it. And we have it. Will we live it?